Praise the Lord. Happy Memorial Day, everyone. Memorial Day weekend to honor those that have given their lives. Of course, we know that Veterans Day is about, you know, just honoring all those that have served. And Memorial Day, though, is uh, those that have lost their lives and in service. And uh, I'd still like to do that if you wouldn't mind. Uh, if you are serving currently or have served in the armed forces, would you please stand so that we can recognize you and say thank you for your service to the Lord. Thank you. You have all the all the banners up on the on the platform, and of course, our United States flag always in the hallway over there on the on the outside over there. Now, this is. Uh, could you give me like about a half an hour? I need to get all my papers in order and stuff like that. Just hang on a second. I got some things over here and over there. I'm just kidding. When I'm not in here and the crew does their job, I'm not the beneficiary of uh, their incredibly awesome work. I'm actually lagging behind and putting things back, but I think we can figure it all out. You say, well, you just preached the message a few minutes ago. Well, I'm over 60 now. It's not like it used to be. Go to Galatians 5 and join me there. And I can't wait for 70, not really. <laughs> is it? Is it all right? You must have taken better care of yourself than I have. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> but we're going to continue in Galatians today. And of course, Galatians chapter number 5. We, we've been looking at what Paul the Apostle uh, would basically tell us is, hey, I'm doing the correction and we know that the Bible says all Scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, reproof, correction, instruction, and in righteousness that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Paul's doing a lot of instruction and in righteousness. He's bringing doctrine, clarifying things. He spent the first couple of chapters teaching us about his apostleship and that he is validated by the Holy Spirit by the Lord Jesus Christ himself who appeared to him and trained him himself. And so his apostleship is a little different than all the other apostles because he wasn't part of the 120 in the upper room in the book of Acts in chapter number 2. So he's a little different. But of course he is an apostle by the Lord's charge. So he's conveying that and he is uh, authenticating that. And of course there are some things that go on in chapter number 1 and 2, a reminder of how he's confronting the Judaizers, the false teachers. He's confronting even Peter, as it says in Galatians 2. Uh, I believe it's verse 10 or 11 where it says he withstood Peter uh, when they had a confrontation at Antioch. Don't forget also, too, that Paul had gone off to visit with him as well, and they did not know each other until these confrontations. So you understand that there is a conflict in doctrine, a conflict in the religiousness and the legalism that has been presented, and Paul's clearing that up in chapter 1 and 2. He continues in chapter 3 and 4. We just finished up 3 and 4 with his arguments of grace, the argument of how historically grace is God's, and grace is truly right there. He used an allegorical uh, statement when we were here to finish up chapter number 4 a couple weeks ago. And, of course, when we look at what Paul has done in, in giving his personal tie into uh, grace as the argument for salvation, grace alone, and he looks at Scripture and the scriptural argument and everything, we come back to this place of saying, okay, Paul, now that you've laid all this down and you've spent these chapters here, um, what do we do with it? Because there are some practical applications that we make every week in our message, but now Overall, in his letter, chapter 5 and 6, is his practical application for us. And, and Paul the Apostle is saying, look, these are ways in which you need to really confront the situation. Confront the matter when it comes to legalism or the law over grace. And again, it goes back to this. Verse number 1 here, 
in chapter 5, and we're going to get into the whole passage in a minute. It says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. That's where we're at again and again and again. Because Paul, when he says, hey, doctrinally I covered some things, historically I gave an account of some things that happened through the book of Acts and in my own life. Now churches of Galatia that he is speaking to, Galatian people, there are some of you in the church that are lost, some of you that are in the church that are believers. I'm addressing this letter to the churches of Galatia, the believers, the Galatian people, and I'm letting you know this. You have to stand fast. You say, well, the whole title of this is Free to Live Faith. Well, today I want you to see something. We get into our introduction and lay the groundwork for our, our message. And, of course, we'll break down. We're going to only take these first six verses. But I want you to see that sometimes we go after the walk and we haven't figured out how to stand. So I start off with a little clip out of a great old hymn. Stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Lift high his royal banner. It must not suffer loss. Remember that old song? From victory unto victory, his army shall he lead. Till every foe is vanquished, and Christ is Lord indeed. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, the trumpet call obey. For to the mighty conflict, and this is glorious day. Ye that are men now serve him against unnumbered foes. Let courage rise with danger and strength to strength oppose. Of course, a little tie into Memorial Day as well. We are the soldiers of the cross, and Paul's saying you need to stand up for Jesus. Stand up for Jesus. Bobby, in preaching last week, and he did reference Romans chapter number one, as well as many other passages, and in, in preaching on this compelling need for us to, to really get on point with the gospel. And we need to be reminded every single day, and we cannot be ashamed of the gospel of Christ, but Paul did say he's a debtor, a debtor to preach the gospel. And this debt's going to come up again because he's a debtor to preach the gospel in his salvation, just like you and me are. He's also a debtor to God for the salvation, as he says in Romans chapter number 8. So we know that debtor part is for the believer. We can never pay it back, but we have a debt to return back. The lost person thinks they can pay the debt of the law. Paul's going to clear that up here and say, hey, you got to stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. You need to stand fast, completely, therefore, wherefore, before for, that I preached in the last two chapters when I said, here's my argument for grace. Here's my argument for grace. Here's my argument for grace. Hey, church, I believe we lived in a place where the second half of verse number one is really messing with us, being entangled with the yoke of bondage. Oh, no, we would never. No, we couldn't be like that. Really. The nation of Israel got out from underneath Pharaoh's thumb. Then things got a little tough. Oh, can we go back to Egypt? We want to go back to Egypt. Oh, let's go back to the bondage that we are in. Moses is one standing on his own going, whoa, 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 what are you doing here? We are much, not much different than those people of Israel that wanted to return back to Egypt in bondage. That's what Paul's saying. He said to the church at Corinth, watch ye, stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. Paul's saying that to the Corinthian church. What, are you, what is he saying? Oh, you're supposed to quit. I know. He said just quit. That's not what it says. It's an old English word. Of course, in the translation from the 1611 to the 1769, we understand very simply that old English word means to acquit. Quit you like men. Acquit. You're acquitted. Remember that if you were ever in, 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 a, in a courtroom and you're being accused of something and then you were freed from the accusation. You were acquitted. Well, what happened to you when you got saved? You were acquitted of all your sin. You're never going to be charged. A few should, enjoy, should join in on the amen because you never are going to be in a place where you have to pay for your sin. Jesus paid it all. 
So quit ye like men basically says this, stand fast in the faith. Stand fast, firm, persevere, persist. Stand fast in the faith, quit you like men, be strong. I guess if you just put that verse on your forehead and looked at it in the mirror every day, you'd go, that's a good way to approach the day. I think we can do this today. Yeah, we mean you and the Lord Jesus Christ by the Holy Spirit of God, by the promises of his word. That's enough. Christ is enough for me. Some of you are singing this up here. I, I, I think as some of you were. And some of you are going, Christ is enough for me. Christ is enough. My gosh. You should be Jesus dancing. Christ is enough for me. Yeah, we can do that. The Psalms say you'll be dancing to Jesus one day. Yeah. You will be. We will be. To me, think on it for a moment. Christ is enough. That ought to be the message today, so maybe we'll get there. We will in a moment. What do you stand fast in? What do you stand fast in? What is it you're firm on? You're, you're, you're set on, you're good on. Is it your family? Um, is it your bank account? Got some good monies. Maybe your retirement. Good job. Standing fast on your church. Standing fast on your marriage, your spouse. Your Those are all good things. But are you standing fast on your salvation? Are you standing fast on the uncertainty that when you take your last breath, you don't know what's going to happen to you? That's not standing fast at all. That's standing in muddy waters. Knowing that you're free to live in Christ, now I talk to you, Christian, you're free to live in Jesus Christ. What are you standing fast on? I fear that we stagger in our walk because we have not learned to stand first. I'm concerned. I'm very concerned. This is a, just a few years of pastoring. I haven't pastored very, very long. I watched youth ministry kids for years stagger in their walk. Watch my own children stagger in their walk. I look upon myself and my, as a dad and my wife and I would go, should we have done this and could we have done better? And because we stagger in our walk. And I'm, I'm wondering if it's the reason is that we haven't learned how to stand first. Anybody ever seen children able to walk from crawling immediately? No, they have to learn to stand. If you have a child that went from crawling to walking the next day, man, you should put him in the Guinness Book of World of Records. My gosh. Well, you don't know my kid. My kid's better than your kid. My kid, they only stood for five seconds and then they walked. Most kids have a difficulty walking without standing, from what I understand. You, spiritually speaking, have a tough time walking in the Lord without knowing where you stand. Do you stand on Jesus? Do you stand, though, on servitude more than the liberty? Do you stand more on leaning on doing some law things to make you feel better in the people around you? Are you looking to please man more than pleasing God? Are you stuck in the same place that these people of Galatia and the Galatian people, these be believers, they're, they're stuck because they've been listening to Judaizers and they've been listening to false teaching. I went through it for years in my, my walk. It's devastating to believe that you have to follow the law after you were saved by grace. No, I love following the law not to prove that I'm saved or not to prove that I can get some grace from God, but rather because it's a joy. I love doing what you want me to do, God, because I love you. Just like when your children come up and just give you a big hug and you go, what's that for? Because I love you. When grandchildren do that, it's even better. It is not a joke. It's true. I mean... Children had kids so that they could actually see their parents parent their grandchildren better than they parented them. You follow? 
We're a lot nicer to our grandchildren than they are, we are to our kids. Huh? I happened to see one of them yesterday. He gave me a beautiful illustration. He was walking around a little bit, this Gabriel guy. He's walking here, he's walking there. He's 14 months old. He thinks he's a beast, you know, and he's barely getting around. He's stammering here. He's staggering here. Well, hang on a minute. I, I got to show you a video of the way this picture is for us today. Here's a great picture for you. <laughs> okay, here he goes. He has to have the little pacifier to balance him. Oh, see him staggering? It's kind of like his grandpa and his walk with the Lord. Here comes Maddie. Oh. And what does he do? He doesn't get back up. He just says, I'm going to sit right there. So there's our picture. The little boy, physically, he's just learning how to walk. But he has to stand first. He has to figure out how to get his balance and stand, how to suck. But he staggered. In his walk, and he sat down. Now, follow me. Is that what happens to us? A famous young man said to me a few weeks ago, We definitely live by faith, the faith that we have, whatever faith that is. And you are free to live faith. Just what kind of faith do you want to live? Part time? Full time, filled with grace, filled with law, filled with works to please man, or just simply to walk by faith in the Lord. We need to stand before we walk. This morning's message, stand before you walk, out of Galatians 5, very simply comes back to this little Gabe guy. This little Gabe guy staggers when he walks, like many believers do. And oftentimes when we stagger so bad, we sit down and we can't get back up. Let's get back up. Let's learn how to stand fast. If we can stand fast, therefore, in this liberty that Jesus Christ has given us, if we stand fast, therefore, referencing the last two, two chapters, therefore, by that grace then we can walk this thing out in the liberty in Christ. But it's going to take a little bit of sweet worship and a beautiful part of communion with you and the Lord, me and the Lord, to learn how to stand before we walk. Let's read the first six verses of chapter number five. And then a little bit of background, and then we'll make three simple points that support this statement to stand before you walk. Verse 1, here we go. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. And be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Which means, again, references the fact that they were entangled before. Entangled when you were lost. Entangled maybe in your being a believer, but entangled by getting the law back on your shoulders like the Judaizers, the false teachers. Peter has been teaching them to do. He's saying, you're entangled again. Verse 2. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the whole law. So here's circumcision reference again. We know about circumcision in the study already because Peter says bring that circumcision back. The Judaizers said, bring that circumcision back. We are Levitical law people. Even though we're believers in Jesus Christ, we have a set of laws for you to follow. We cover that in chapters number 1, 2, a little bit 3 and 4 with grace, but 1 and 2, we really looked at that because, hey, the circumcision needs to come back. Of course, Peter also said, hey, you shouldn't be around those Gentiles. But we finished out chapter number 4 with realizing, hey, we're not of the bond woman. We're of the free woman. We are free in the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have to be trapped by the Ishmael birth. We are free in the birth of Sarai to Isaac and the promise through Abraham, Father Abraham. 
And so we don't need that circumcision. But he's saying, hey, if you're a debtor to that circumcision, which he's referencing in general as the law, then you're a debtor to the whole law. If you're going to keep one part of it, then do it all. And since you can't, you ought to just go back to, ah, Christ is enough for me. Jesus Christ is enough. I have liberty in Christ, so stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Again, let me just reiterate in our study. This is not something that instantaneously happens tomorrow morning when you wake up and go, hey, I'm free to live in Christ. It's going to be a beautiful day in Jesus. I'm going to do everything for him. It's you spending time with him, getting the mind of Christ, getting the heart of Christ, getting the beauty of his incredible love for you, or else... It'll fall apart after a day or two or three. And then you will be like little Gabe, walking for a while, staggering, 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 boom. He has a, di a diaper, though, so his bottom has got more cushion. Maybe some of you are wearing diapers. I don't know. And that may be helping you with a cushion when you fall. But diapers are for messes, correct? So let's take our diapers off. And realize we can grow in the Lord. We can grow in the grace and knowledge. And we don't have to, again, be drawn back to a place that's so convenient for all of us. A little bit of servitude and a little bit of duty. And guess what? It'll be okay. No, no, no. We're always drawn to that place. Here we are in verse number four. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Remember, he's not referencing someone who's born again who then has fallen from grace. That is not what he is saying. He is speaking to the lost people. Verse number four says, whosoever of you are justified by the law, you're saying that I've been made just by the law. You really believe that you're going to be born again by the law? Uh-uh-uh. Just covered that in the last few chapters. He's saying, hey, I'll give you a simple example. My brother Frank is... Just always so close to being saved. My brother Frank knows as much about the Bible, as much about Bible verses from my brother David and I constantly. He's fallen from grace because he's fallen short. He keeps on coming up short. Yeah, I believe that, but. I believe that, but. I'm not ready to. It's hard for him to really believe, for by grace are you saved through faith. That not of yourselves is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's very hard for my father-in-law, who's 80 years old, and my wife is visiting him this week. And I said, you got to have a talk with him. And another talk, and another talk. Well, he won't. I, I know. He's going to fall from grace. Because he believes he can earn his way into God's goodness. Just like all the other Jews from the Old Covenant. It's heartbreaking, but that's what Paul is saying. Whosoever of you are justified, I believe you've justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Verse 5 and 6, they're beautiful. They kind of culminate this first section here in a beautiful way. He says, for we, believers, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. We're waiting for the hope. It's referenced again in verse 6. For in Jesus Christ neither circumcision availeth anything nor uncircumcision, but faith which worketh by love. Ooh. You see, that's some beautiful stuff. We wait on the hope of our salvation. Our salvation is pure and perfect. And one day we will know that perfection in glory. For in Jesus Christ, circumcision doesn't get anything done. Nor uncircumcision gets anything done. Even your own righteousness and your physical stuff. Neither one of them do anything. But faith which worketh by love. Boy, oh boy, thank you for your word, God. Thank you for your truth, God. I wonder what it's like for you in the audience hearing the word of God being taught, not by, by me, but by the spirit of God. Do you feel like you're one of the Galatians hearing this and going, I remember when the bells and whistles went off. I remember when Learning all that I learned in the word of God did not need to be translated through the law and keeping rules, but rather in the liberty that I had in the Lord Jesus Christ that I was free to just love him. 
I remember when that changed my walk. And when Paul set forth a command right here in verse number one, he said something that's very, very important. If you refuse to do this command and obey it, some things are going to go goofy. So that's just how we're going to talk about this for five minutes. Refusal to obey the command in verse number one through six puts us in a place where doctrinally we go, okay, where's the command? I thought you said it wasn't the law. I thought you said we didn't have to do the law. He's saying, look, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. The command is to stand fast in the beauty of the word of God, in the beauty of the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross and the resurrection. It's beautiful to think this is this is the way I should live. I was saying something to somebody yesterday, a day before we were talking for a minute. I said, we, we've, gotten, we, we've gotten so convoluted when we read the Word of God that we think the if-then statements or the places where God says this is going to happen. And by the way, we're going to get one of the big ones in Galatians 6. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever man soweth, that shall he also reap. See, you got what you deserved. It's a biblical principle from God. God doesn't have to add anything. If you sow bad seeds, you get a bad crop. That's not God's fault. You have communion for the wrong, with the wrong person, you join to the wrong person, and it goes rough. If you sow things that are of this world, if you sow things of the law, you'll get it in return. So very simply, God's saying, here's a command that if you go this way and do it this way, it's going to be beautiful. You're going to please me, and you're going to be pleased and blessed by your life. He says that there's, just let me just cover a few little things, and then we'll make practical application as he is giving us practical teaching from his letter. He says, hey, in that first one there in verse number two, Christ doesn't profit you anything. If you say that circumcision is important. To receive circumcision, to gain merit from God, would be like anything else that you would do in the law. You say, well, I wouldn't go off and get circumcised. That's going to be too painful. What about just doing a list of things that you heard the pastor tell you to do to make you a better Christian? Instead of going into the word of God and seeing what the pastor said and saying, thus saith the Lord, God told me to do this, I should do it. We try to somehow, some way, merit God's favor instead of allowing God to see our lives filled with this incredible, firmly fixed stand, which then dictates how we walk. And we're not taking away anything from the atonement of Jesus Christ. It's perfect. Grace is given to us because of not something that we have done or because it's man's will, but it's God's will that he gave us what he's given us. It's God's actions that we're talking about here, not man's. To trust in Jesus Christ for salvation is the acknowledgement that you cannot save yourself. Now, why would it not be the same way in your walk with the Lord or in your stand? Stand in the liberty, though. Not stand with self-righteousness or self-sufficiency or I can do this, I can handle it myself. I'm working on that. How about if we just say, you know what? I went to the cross where I got saved and I just laid some things down and went, God, you saved my soul 30 years ago and I'm laying this down. Every time I say I'm working on something, I'm wrong. I need to have you work on me. I've decided to give this matter to you. I've decided I'm going to stand and I have a resolve, then I will walk. Again, I decide, I then stand, and then I have a resolve to stand, and then I walk. But we want to jump and run and walk, and even like the little guy, he wants to go 100 miles an hour, boom, forehead, head plant. He's got a few bumps on his skull, by the way. We joke a little bit about our grandchildren. They, they do have a great deal of their brains are very big. I'll just say it that way, absolutely. But that can cause, just physically speaking for the children, they're, they're learning how to walk and get used to it. Well, guess what? 
when you get filled up with the things that God's showing you, you're saying, I want to be profited by knowing Jesus Christ. Circumcision will profit me nothing. He says also in verse number three, you're a debtor to the whole law if you go down that road. That's another incredibly important thing. The fulfillment of part of the law just falls short. So why don't you do the whole law? God's standard is absolute. It's perfect righteousness, it says in James chapter number 2. The law stands or falls as a whole. You can't just pick and choose and pick and choose. Well, I'm born again and I like some of these laws with some of the other things I don't. So now you're trying to justify yourself before the Lord by saying, here, aren't I a good person? Paul establishes incredible truth early on in this letter by saying, hey, there's false teachers that will woo you into a place where you can look really, really good and play a game. Well, if that's the case, then why don't you just be the debtor to the whole law? I'm going to do the whole law. Well, <laughs> you can't. That just brings a yoke of bondage. God broke that yoke. You know that, right? He broke that yoke with his own, Jesus Christ. See, Paul then starts talking to the lost real quick and reminding them in verse 4, I mentioned it earlier, Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Just keep this in mind. Paul's not dealing with the security of the believer, but the incredible contrast between the principles of law and legalism and grace and faith. The lost person continues to try and find his way to God the believer who still thinks that the law is more important will somehow, some way, get mixed up with, I wonder if God was happy with me today because I did this, 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 and this. I preached a message, I think, a couple years ago about just checking off the box, checking off the box. Well, I sung some hymns today. I sung some songs today. I listened to a message. Uh, Bobby did a good Bible lesson there, so I checked that off, and that was really good. He taught, and then Doc Clemma, and then, and, then, and then we did that, and then we had a good discipleship hour, and we checked that off. Brian, good job. I did that, and then the ushers did this, and then we did all that, and we checked all this stuff off, and we go, oh, God, aren't you happy with me today? I speak from my own personal failures. I don't like that. I choose to live by standing fast, therefore, in the liberty. He also says, in pulling together a couple more things, you and I, when we see this legalism creep into us, and I've mentioned it a few times in our series, it works the flesh. It makes man receive glory and in glorifying man, we are failing major. You see, legalism does glorify man. He takes credit for things that God has done. He manipulates the circumstances and the words so that he can get a pat on the back. But grace glorifies God. Grace always glorifies God. It never misses. Every time. Well, aren't you glad that I extended you some grace? I could have taken you out today. That's just a law-abiding, legalistic attitude. See, Paul's talking clearly to two bunches of people. The people that are believers that want to fall back into that Judaizer way and the lost that are so confused by which way to go for salvation, they're stuck. They're like the kid that sits down in the living room and says, I can't move anymore. But for me, and what the Lord is showing me today, it comes to this statement that I have up on the screen. Stand fast. Stand fast. Not just stand before you walk. Stand fast. Stand firm. Unmovable. Unshakable. The law won't get it done for you. The law is going to fail you 100% out of 100% of the time. When it comes to you saying, that's how God's going to be pleased. The result of you living in grace is, I got liberty in Christ. I'm just going to do that thing that God wanted me to do. Woohoo! I said that earlier. Now the law is important to you in a whole nother way. The kids look at things in your life and go, why do you do that? I just 
love to serve the Lord. Why do you do that? Because I love doing things for the Lord. Why are you doing here and going there? Because it's just for the Lord Jesus Christ. The liberty life is not a guilt-filled life. So the first thing is this. Stand fast in your liberty in Christ before it turns into a life filled with guilt. I'm talking about living a life before God that's filled with guilt. If you think you're the only one that's ever walked through that, that's why Paul's writing it. That's why David wrote some of the most incredible psalms. That's why many of the psalmists took to the pen by the Holy Spirit to say that God's the one who's going to hold on to things for me. My liberty in Christ is the way I want to live. A liberty of life is a whole lot better. The principle of life that brings, this principle of life that brings a response to follow the Lord Jesus Christ gives him pleasure. I want to please him. When I please Jesus, when I please the Lord, I don't have one single bit of guilt. Not one bit. It's a nice way to live. But on the other side, when I take my liberty and I push it out the door, I say, you know what? You guilted me into it, God. You guilted me into it, God. What's the answer to this? Psalm 121. I have one verse up on the screen. You'll have to go to Psalm 121 to catch me. So Psalm 121, verse number one, I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from whence cometh my help. Now this is going to get gooder and gooder. You might get a little excited. My help comes from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. Behold, he that keepeth Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is thy keeper. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. He shall preserve thy soul. The Lord shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. Do you and I have any idea... Well, yeah, you can have an idea that the Lord is your keeper, the Lord is your shade, the Lord will not smite thee by day, the Lord will preserve thy soul, the Lord has got you. It says in verse number two, my help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Why is it that you would rather go to the law? The law was your schoolmaster and is our schoolmaster to reveal to us that we need Jesus Christ. You cannot fulfill all the righteousnesses of God that he desires unless you're in Jesus Christ. He said, you want that old way of living? You want to have this awful bondage in your life? You want to have your liberty discounted and then choose to live a way where you can just try to get by by the law, get by by the law, get by by the law. When you find out at the end of the day, you're filled with guilt. You're guilt-ridden. What a way to live. Thank you, God, that you showed me your word. Maybe he's showing that to you today. We need to stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Free to what? Fulfill his pleasure. That's what you were made for. For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good. His pleasure. Revelation 4. What were you created for? His pleasure. Hebrews 11.6, it is impossible to please him without faith. He's pleased by that. Stand fast. Stand fast against the yoke of bondage. This yoke of bondage, if we do not stand fast against the yoke of bondage, it will turn into a life-paying debt. What debt? The debt that he describes in here. The debt that no way could you pay. I mentioned the, the, the debt of the believer, but what about the debt of those that believe they can fulfill the whole law? You will spend your whole life in a yoke of bondage going back there and go back there go back there. It was wrong teaching. I don't care what anybody says. Because it's against God's word. And Paul dealt with it. And if you think anyone teaching that against God's word is right, they're wrong. 
They're wrong. I don't care. Paul taught. He, he withstood Peter. So are the fundamentals of faith right? Yes. Is the word of God right? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit of God right? Yes. Get a handle on it. Stop doing what Bobby told you to do and Brian told you to do and Dwayne told you to do. Do what God told you to do. You'll live a lot better there. Guess what? They'll all be pleased with you there. We'll all be happy together. And the people that are lost that see your life, they'll go, whoa, why do you do that? Because I love pleasing the Lord. I'm free in him. I don't like the bondage that I was under when I did it everything. And I ended up finding myself in an absolute mess. I was still trying to pay the debt back to God that I could never pay. Not the debt of because I owe him to preach the gospel because I'm a debtor to him for saving my soul. I'm talking about the debt that we think we have to pay because we made up a mess last week. Yeah, you made a mess. Go make it right with him. Because the blood of Jesus Christ has already taken care of it all. You don't make it right with him, you're going to be in a mess. And you will live in a mess of bondage. Because you'll go try to do some rules to make yourself feel better. I grew up in a Catholic church. Oh boy, penance. Doing penance. One out of the Father, two Hail Marys, a couple of active conditions, a few apostle creeds. I'm not condemning the people that grew up in that, but the teaching from that church is downright twisted, and it is wrong. And if you're a Catholic that's still struggling with that, hey, I'm available. Sit and chat. I'll buy you a coffee because it's a battle. In my first 20 years, I was saved, and somebody put me under a yoke of bondage, man. Yes, whatever you say, Captain. Yes, Captain. I forgot the captain of my stinking faith was Jesus Christ. And I did everything to please man. Not everything, but a lot. It cost me a lot. He's like, it'll cost you. Paul's telling them it's going to cost you. Oh, let's throw the book of Galatians out the Bible. Well, there's a few others that we probably should throw out too, like the book of Romans. Romans and Galatians are brother and sister letters. Salvation by grace servanthood by grace you serve the lord jesus christ by grace you serve it by obligation rule duty and law you will be a miserable creature trying to pay a debt you can never pay lastly let's go ahead and skip right to the end the third one and by the way if you want a reference on that the reference there was psalm 16 verses 1 through 8 here we are in the last one. Stand fast in the hope of your salvation. The hope of your salvation. Go to Psalm 62. We'll be there in a moment. Just look at that for a minute. You stand fast in the hope of your salvation before it turns into a life of insecurity. How many of you have been insecure about your faith at one time or another, don't raise your hand. Doing youth work, doing ministry, working with young people, teenagers for years. I can remember when I got saved, but I don't know if I'm saved. I can remember I got saved, I don't know. And I, I was agonized for them because they were so insecure. And then a young adult, and then an older adult, and then, I don't know, I don't live like I've lived... I don't live like I'm saved. I'm not born. I must be lost. What a wrestling match. What a fight. And then we sit back and go, well, they mustn't be saved because their fruits, they're terrible. I wish God would call me out, man. I, I'll take care of this. I'll fix it all. Where's your grace? Where's your mercy? Where's your compassion? For the prodigal son that ran away, but the father didn't move an inch. What is the matter with us? That we think that when someone falls or something is a mess, that we cannot exhibit grace. When they're in a place of insecurity and they might even end their own lives. Are we so foolish to believe that we can play God instead of opening up the word of God and saying, this is what God has for you. Come unto me, all ye that labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. 
That yoke that you carried of bondage was taken away at the cross. It's all gone. Stop putting that yoke of bondage on your life. The hope of your salvation, that's the way you need to live. No matter what, he's going to take care of you. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things of present. He is going to take care of you. He's got you. Now come on back. Come on back. Come on back. But I'm insecure and I don't know if he'll take me back. He'll take you back, I promise you. Boy, what the church would look like. Hallelujah. If we would just come back to the Lord and admit that we struggle terribly. We stagger like little Gabe. That we have this awful propensity to jump all the things. When God says, just come back to me. And stand fast in the liberty wherewith Jesus Christ made you free. Psalm 62, I'll finish. Verse number one says, Truly my soul waiteth upon God, for he, him cometh, excuse me, from him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. You love this psalm. You've got to love this psalm. Psalm 62, put it as one of your favorites. How long will ye imagine mischief against man? Ye shall be slain, all of you, as bowing wall shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly, say la. Here we go. Verse number 5, 6, 7, 8. My soul, my soul, wait thou only upon God. For my expectation is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Now you can walk if you stand right there. You can't move me, Satan. You can't move me, world. You can't move me, flesh. Because I stand in the promises of God. Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. And here it is, verse number 7 and 8. In God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. In that life, in that place where you're insecure, put your hope back in your salvation. Because your salvation is his. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. The salvation you have is his. And he said you can have it. Here's the hope of your salvation. I finished with this thought. Putting back the quote of verse number one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Just, just grab that one. Memorize that. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. It's us, U.S., us, all of us believers. He's made us free together. So encourage one another. You're free in the Lord. Serve the Lord. Say no to all that and say yes to him. Put on the new garments. You have new garments. Put them all on. They're beautiful. Ephesians chapter number 4. Uh, Colossians chapter number 3. Put on the new garments. But today maybe you may have to put off something. So it says up there. The last creed. What has, my English is not proper. What has entangled you? In a yoke of bondage today. What has you entangled? That's verse number one. Now it's you and God. Our Father in heaven, we come to you right now in prayer. After your word has been spoken, we humbly ask you to work a name, work, uh, work a work in the name of Jesus. I, Father, uh, by your Spirit, put upon our hearts as believers the need to be no longer entangled with the yoke of bondage today in legalism. And I pray today that also, too, that as your work and your word is at work, that if there are anybody lost that doesn't and hasn't been justified by the work of Jesus Christ, that maybe 
you're speaking to them as well. God, have your way in this invitation. It's your time. It's always your time. In Jesus' name, amen.